Welcome to the Truth Podcast. I am your host, Anthony Benitez, coming to you guys from beautiful Los Angeles, California. Yes, I want to give a special shout out to all of our lovely listeners in China. Yes, in China. What is going on? Uh, I've been uh, told that we have a pretty strong group, like over a hundred people in China continue continuously listening in and also in canada montreal quebec in canada this is awesome i mean I, i am super humbled and honored and i'm just super excited i love that the lord himself is bringing in all types of listeners from every literally every country in the continent whether it's in asia whether it's in the middle east whether it's in europe south america central america the americas the old world new world whatever it is i am super excited so welcome welcome and man uh, what an awesome family that we have here today is going to be a great episode i will continue as promised on teaching yes sometimes i preach as you can tell uh, i'm an evangelist as well so sometimes i preach sometimes i teach and to be quite honest with you, I, I really do believe that there is a place for uh, exhortation. I do a lot of exhortation. It is a gift. Uh, the Bible says in Romans that the, there is a gift of exhortation. So I believe in exhortation. I believe in uh, preaching. You know, there are some things that we need to be preached into. We, we, uh, we prosper, the Bible says in the Old Testament, that we prosper by the preaching of the Word of God. And to bring this into the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians, the Bible says that it pleases God that through the foolishness of preaching, He will sozo, heal, bless, save, make whole. He will save those who believe. So never underestimate the Word of God. I, I was speaking to Ethan about this earlier today. Faith, 99.9% of the time, goes against our logic. It's like the Pharaoh and all of his little taskmasters were chasing down Israel. This is found in, in Exodus, right? After they left Egypt, by the way, they left Egypt, which is a type of our new birth, leaving the kingdom of darkness. They left Egypt with silver and with gold and with none feeble. That's health and that's wealth. And what happened afterwards is that Pharaoh and his chariots and his taskmasters, which is Pharaoh is the type of the devil, his taskmasters are little dominion, a little uh, minions of, of devils. When they were chasing down the children of Israel, the answer from heaven at that time when Israel and Moses cried out, for help was to stand still imagine like in our mind uh, why am i saying this because faith remember faith 99.9 percent of the times will contradict our logic so at that time when we had when they had pharaoh and the taskmasters chasing them down the natural inclination logically is to fight or to run away or to do something but they could not run away because on one hand they were surrounded by the by pharaoh and their chariots on the other hand was the red sea so what the answer from heaven was to stand still that is like the formula if you study warfare like physical war you know the art of war whatever it is logically to the natural mind to the natural man that is a formula to be uh devoured it's to sit there like a sitting duck and just like you can expect nothing but catastrophe and death but the ways of grace and faith are against our natural reasoning why because our natural reasoning this is going to offend me and you our natural reasoning, the Bible says, not Anthony, the Bible says that our the carnal mind, the natural mind, is an enmity against God. That word enmity, when you look it up, it means to be actively hostile against something. So let's put this together. 
the carnal mind, the natural mind, what we logically reason, the Bible says the carnal mind is actively hostile against God. So when we understand that, then when the Lord says, sit still and see the salvation, though our feelings may be like, wow, this is illogical, but it's faith. When the Lord says to Gideon, blow a trumpet, the lamb's horn, break the earthen vessels, breaking of the will, and the light that is inside of the earthen vessels will shine through, and the entire Midianites will be destroyed. That doesn't make sense. Like, it was the middle of the night for Gideon and his people. In warfare, you want to be as sneaky as possible. This was the night. So think about it, Dre. It's like you have Gideon and his 300 men. They were going to attack the Midianites. This was at nighttime. And naturally, it's like, all right, stay very stealthy. Like, stay stealth. Stay, stay very low profile. Do not make a noise. Be very sneaky. Sneak into their camp. And just begin to slit their throats from, you know, I'm being very graphic, but I'm, I'm kind of, I'm being very emphatic and just sneak in there and just like, just kill all of them. That's natural reasoning, right? But what did the Lord say to Gideon and to his 300 men? Make a noise. Wake up the enemies. Sh shout with the horn. So you wake them up. And then you don't even have swords. You do not even have a musket. Or a gun. You know what they had? They had a light, a candle, and it was covered with an earthen vessel. So the Lord said, Gideon, yeah, you wanna you wanna win in this war? Yeah, tell me the secrets of warfare. So I want you to go when it's very dark, when they're sleeping, and I want you to make a loud noise and wake them up. He's like, What? And that and then after you wake them up. Don't take your swords with you. <laughs> Just take a little candle with an earthen vessel and break the earthen vessel so that the light comes out. And that will bring the victory. It did. The word of the Lord endures forever. So why am I saying these things? Same thing with Jericho. Jericho is like they just walked around the Jericho walls for seven days. On the seventh day, they just shouted in victory. That's called grace. And the, the walls that were so fortified of Jericho just came down. That's illogical. Just walk around those thick Jericho walls and then shout on the seventh day and they'll come down. Just stand still and you'll see the salvation. Don't be sneaky, but rather wake up your enemies in the middle of the night. David... Don't bring any uh, proper armor of warfare with you, but just take a sling and three and, th and five smooth stones. Don't even bring the armor. Don't even take the most military trained guy. Just go a little handsome, ruddy, 17-year-old boy, the Bible says, David, without any type of armor, without any type of sword. Just go into battle with Goliath. As a shepherd boy, dressed as who you are, a shepherd boy, with a sling and five smooth stones. That's illogical. The breaking of the vessels with Gideon is illogical. The standstill with Moses at the Red Sea is illogical. Shouting and walking around quietly, not even making a noise, a, a thing of rest around the Jericho walls is illogical. Uh, I mean, I can go on and on and on and on. So I want that was for someone because we have to recognize the ways of faith and grace. Because why? Then we can flow with God. Then when he says tithe, in your mind, you're like, how am I prospering by decreasing? But doesn't the Bible say in Proverbs that there is a person who scatters seed and increases in wealth? But there was another person who withholds their money, thinking that they're saving, but it leads to poverty. Irrational to the natural mind. But newsflash, the world is upside down. Did you know that? Did you know that we live in a fallen world? That everything is upside down. So if, if we think saving money is for prosperity, it's upside down. But the Bible says, give and you'll be blessed. The Bible says the generous soul, this is in Proverbs, the generous soul will be made rich. 
and he that waters shall he himself be watered. So I, I'm teaching this before we get into good works and dead works because uh, th we have to learn the ways of grace. Th then we can flow with God. Then we'll see the results because we're not swimming against the grain. Because we're not resisting the Holy Spirit. Because we're not resisting the ways of grace and of faith. If we begin to realize and recognize how the Lord moves and operates. So, uh, what is good works and what is dead works? I think this is a phenomenal, phenomenal series. And it's so much so that the Lord prompted me and uh, confirmed it with my wife. We were both like, typically we kind of wait a couple you know, days to, to give people time to eat. But I'm just laying it, I'm just going to lay it on you. I, I, I'm probably going to teach one more episode and I have a lot more. I'm just so blessed and grateful for the Lord to give me so much wisdom. Not so you can build a golden statue of my face. But really, I was talking to Jared about this yesterday because we were watching about St. Peter's Basilica. And they were misquoting a Bible verse. And then out of nowhere, within my spirit, I just literally quoted for the entire chapter almost. And in my mind, I, I began to ask myself, you know, why? This gift obviously is not for me to be puffed up. This gift... That the Lord has given me by grace, not by merit or behavior. This gift is for the church. This gift is to defend the truth. This, this gift is for the body of Christ. To edify. To defend the truth of the gospel. To defend the, the holy scriptures. That's how Paul sp uh, spoke. He said in Philippians, recognizing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. So I, I was truly humbled, and, I, and I'm telling you this because I want you to realize you're not just listening to mere words of man. Otherwise, we're 13 minutes in. Most social media statistics show people can't even concentrate for 30 seconds nowadays. How are you listening for 13 minutes? And I haven't even started. It's because of the grace of Jesus Christ for the church to teach, to bring to perfection, to bring to maturity, to bring to the knowledge of Jesus and his finished work. So as I was meditating on this with, with my wife last night, like, man, I am taken back. And I want to tell you that so you can be rest assured that what you're listening to on this podcast, this is not um, head knowledge. This is not like mere words of men. And Jesus is my witness who will confirm it unto you and has confirmed it multitude of times. So I'm telling you this because I want you to have your, your expectation set that what I, what I am saying by the Lord in me is sent to help you to diffuse any confusion to really dispel like a shepherd the lies of the enemy all this you know what babylon means babylon means confusion the objective of the devil is to bring you as a believer onto confusion which is why I believe, to be honest with you, the Lord has me on this series about good works. Because if I don't answer this question, it would all your conscience will never be at rest. Then you will begin to doubt, am I really following the true message? Because I, I see that the Bible says good works a lot in the New Testament, specifically Paul. So, you know, how, how does this go together? Are they contradictive? My friend, the scriptures do not contradict themselves. We must, be, we must rightfully divide the word of God and recognize, like I mentioned in the previous episode, which I suggest you go check it out. You can before or after, it doesn't matter. It, there's there's, there's a, a sequence to all things. We can't demand good works without being established in righteousness by faith. We can't demand good works without understanding grace. Because then you try to work for your salvation. You must first be established in righteousness by, by faith and in grace. And grace teaches you. Grace will teach you. So let's go to Titus and begin to address specific uh, questions. This was in uh, Titus. Let me pull this up. Titus is, by the way, a great epistle written by the Apostle Paul. This is in Titus. 
chapter uh, 3. Here we go. I'm sorry. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 says this. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our God, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, passionate for good works, zealous. That word zealous means passionate for good works. So I think it's important to address this because if you read the Bible, which I hope you do, if you read the Bible and you see these things and, and your conscience doesn't have an answer, you, will, you, you cannot be in faith. You will have doubt. But rest assured that good works is not against grace. As I mentioned, you must first be established in grace and then good works comes as a fruit. We looked at uh, Romans chapter 5 in the previous episode where the Bible talks about fruit being a, a, I'm sorry, where the Bible talks about holiness. Holiness is a fruit. Romans chapter 5. So holiness and good works is a fruit that comes after, remember I talked about sequence, after understanding you have been made righteous by faith after understanding you are under grace and dead to the law because we must recognize there is a stark difference between dead works and good works paul used this terminology in the majority of his epistles good works there is a difference between dead works and good works so as you read in titus chapter 2 the beginning of this passage it began with for you know for the grace of god that brings salvation has appeared to all teaching us that let's pause who or what is teaching us because verse 11 says the grace of god has appeared to all men teaching us that so who who, who is doing the teaching here what is teaching us to deny ungodliness what is teaching us to live a holy and godly life Let, let's Read the scriptures. The Bible says the grace of God has appeared. And then that same grace teaches you to deny ungodliness, to live a life worthy of the Lord. So grace, as a minister, I preach and teach grace. And grace teaches you to deny ungodliness and to live a life worthy of the Lord, to be a good testimony for Christ. So, and it's it's very subtle, I believe, because when the Bible talks about perversion of the gospel, I'll give you an example that will probably catch your attention if you're falling asleep. When something is perverted, it means it's misused or misapplied. For example, fornication. What is fornication? Having sex outside of marriage. So sex and intimacy... Didn't I tell you it, it will catch your attention and wake you up? Sex and intimacy has been ordained by God in the confines of a marriage. But when that is perverted, it's not like sex is taken away. It's still there, but it's misused. It's, it's misapplied. So when sex is perverted, sex is intended by God to have sex with your wife, with your husband, with your spouse in the confines of a marriage. So when sex is perverted, that means it's still there. It's not like sex is just completely gone, but it's outside of marriage. It is outside of the way the Lord has ordained it to be. It's misused. It's misapplied. So that's what perversion is. So let's apply that to when the Bible talks about in Galatians chapter 1, that there are those who pervert the gospel. So it's not like the gospel isn't there. It's not like people are not talking about grace. It's not like it's just gone away. But it's there, but it's misused. It's misapplied. It's misconstrued. It's not being rightfully divided 
the way that the Lord has ordained it to be. Just like we we're, were talking about intimacy within marriage. So every, it's there. But people are not applying it the way that the Lord has ordained it to be. It's there, but it's being perverted. So when when we realize that good works and great and grace, they go hand in hand. However, grace, grace and the gospel of grace, which is the, the only true gospel, Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul by the Spirit of God says, I have been ordained to preach the gospel of grace. And in Galatians, the Bible talks about it is the gospel of grace because grace is Jesus. So when we understand this and then we read in the scriptures, good works, ordained to good works, good works, good works, good works. It's like, okay, wait, wait a minute. As a believer, if I don't have this question answered, I'm at a standstill. Because on one hand, I have grace preachers telling me it's not about good works. And then on the other hand, I have any type of religious organization telling me, you need to work, you need to work, you need to work. And then on one hand, I'm reading the scriptures and the Bible says, Paul, by the Spirit of God, in his epistle said, if any man does not work, neither should he eat. Then Paul said, but I labor according to the grace that is given to me. I strive and I labor by the grace that is given to me more than anyone else. This is Paul by the Spirit of God in 1 Corinthians. We used to be at a church and they would preach that all the time. You see, Paul used to work. Paul said he outworks every other apostle. He did, but the Bible says it is by grace. So it's like, it, 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 it's not, they're not against each other. Good works and grace, they're not at odds. We just, we're just missing the point. We're taking things out of context. We're not understanding the New Testament. We are not understanding, and I'm taking this to Hebrews chapter 6 now, we are not understanding the first elementary principles of Christianity. If I were to sit down any believer and say, Andrea, what is the first principles of Christianity? They would say, well, repent from sin, bless God, live a life holy. You know, I, I was watching this documentary, where well, I kind of turned it off, of John Huss. In the 1600s or 15 late 1500s, John Huss was a great was a great man of faith. He was actually Dre. If you didn't know, John Huss came before Martin Luther, and John Huss was preaching about righteousness by faith, and he was actually martyred because he said he believed that believers had the right, according to the Holy Scriptures, to receive communion in their own home. Because at that time, during the Catholic Church, only the Pope would have the best wine and would have the bread. And no one was able to receive communion outside of the Catholic Church. So John Huss was martyred for believing about receiving communion at home and righteousness by faith. But then I'm watching this documentary, Dre, which I turned it off. And like I'm one minute in and then it's they're reading his biography. And then he says, this is John Huss, he said, um, he said, Christians, I urge you to live a life worthy of the Lord, keeping God's law. I stopped. I said, I'm sorry. Goodbye. I'm not going back into Egypt. And I changed it. So it, it, it's, it's, this is a, and this goes all the way back to the, the council at Jerusalem found in Acts chapter 14. So th this is a, a core theological and doctrine issue that has happened since the inception of the church and the beauty of it is that you don't have to rely on my book that i write to you you don't have to rely about any other person's book just open the bible open the scriptures the truth is the truth and can withstand questioning I think it was Napoleon Bonaparte who said the Bible has the power. Maybe you can look it up. The Bible has its own power to defend itself. I believe Napoleon said that. So the truth, if it's the truth, has the power of, of, to withstand itself under scrutiny, under questioning. So good works and grace are not at odds. In fact, when you are full of grace, you are full of good works. 
So Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 says this way. And Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 is telling us the first principles of Christianity. So again, if I asked you, what are the first principles of Christianity, believer? They would say just repent from sin, live life holy, um, give to charity, and remember the poor. Is that fair enough to say? But what does the Bible say that the first elementary teachings of Christianity are? Let's read it. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, and that word in Greek is Christianity. It's the, the doctrine of Christ, which is Christianity. So verse 1, Hebrews 6. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation so now it begins to talk about the foundations of christianity number one the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards god i'm going to focus on that today of the doctrine of baptisms of the laying on of hands of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment and this we will do if god permits so this is talking about the four doctrines, in essence, that are considered elementary, baby, like babyhood, infancy in Christianity. And the very first doctrine, the very first principle doctrine in Christianity is repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. What is dead works? Dead works is any work, and Prince concurs with this, Dead works is any work that you are doing to get a pardon, a blessing, or anything from God. In other words, it's a bribe. I scratch your back, you scratch my back. That's called dead works. There is no fruit to it. That is why right afterwards it says repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Because... In another scripture, in Hebrews, the Bible says that those believers who are babes, who are infants, are not familiar with the doctrine of righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith, which is what we teach on here, is that you have been made righteous by simple faith in the finished work of the cross of Christ. So when someone asks you, what is the doctrine of righteousness by faith? I, th these are good like Bible classroom studies. So when someone asks you, hey, what is the doctrine of righteousness by faith? Righteousness by faith is someone being declared righteous in the sight of a holy God, outside of the works of the law, but by simple faith in the finished work. Of the cross of Christ. Righteousness by faith is being declared righteous in the sight of a holy God apart from the works of the law. Apart from the law. That's fine in Romans chapter 3 and 4. Apart from the law and with simple faith in the finished work of the cross of Christ. In other words, you have been made righteous not by works but by faith. After you understand that you are saved by grace, after you understand that you have been made completely righteous, that's called faith towards God. So that now you see that repentance from dead works, which is doing any work with the sole intention of receiving a pardon, a blessing, a healing, a deliverance, receiving anything from God. That is your intention while you are doing that. You are serving in the church because you chewed out your son after soccer practice. So that's your little guilt offering. You are praying all through the night in order to receive a blessing. That's called dead works. You are fasting from January 1st to January 21st in order to receive a blessing from God, that's called dead works, because we are born sinners. 
And even as a believer, this is how I know that when you understand the depravity of sinful flesh, you understand grace. Because if we believe that any of these religious dead works could achieve a blessing from God, we are highly mistaken and blind to the sinfulness of humanity. Because no amount of good works, or dead works, I should say, no amount of dead works has any significance in the sight of a holy and perfect God. In fact, the Bible says in Isaiah that our righteousness are as filthy rags in the sight of God. Our righteousness are as dirty toilet rags in the sight of God. Did you know that? So when we're praying through the night, when we're fasting for 21 days, when we're doing A, B, and C to please God, to get a blessing from God, to be worthy enough to A, B, and C, we are literally tossing soiled toilet napkins in the sight of a holy and perfect God and saying, Father, is this good enough for your perfection? The answer is an emphatic no. So that is what dead works is. Dead works is doing anything to please God, to get a blessing from God, doing anything to achieve some sort of um, healing, some sort of deliverance. If I just fast for 14 days and stop smoking cigarettes, then I will be delivered. And notice how that never works. Because deliverance, healing, anything that you receive from God on this side of heaven must be by faith in His grace. That is why the Bible says it is of faith that it might be by grace that the inheritance might be effective to you, the seed. You're learning a lot today. So this is how you receive from God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace that the inheritance, which includes healing, which includes deliverance, which includes blessing for prosperity, which includes the anointing, which includes any type of gift and blessing you can ever think of on this side of heaven. Any type of blessing is a part of your inheritance. And the Bible emphatically proclaims that therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace that the inheritance is effective to all the seed. Therefore, the Bible says, them that are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So dead works is, again, anything that we try to do, praying fast, all, all, our, is praying bad? No. Were you waiting for me to say something else? Is praying bad? No. I love to pray. But I pray from a position of not trying to, you know, I need to stir myself up to get holy enough. You know, God looks down and says, man, Anthony, you only prayed, uh, what is it, 40 minutes today? Are you kidding me? Could you not stay up for me with an hour? People quote that a lot. I remember in the Word of Faith circle, Kenneth Hagin made it a dogma and Prince brought it up. So I'm bringing it up. Bless God. How Kenneth Hagin made it a dogma where, you know, you need to pray one hour a day. And now all of a sudden, every believer, myself included, we would just put the timer in and just pray for an hour a day. Why? So you can you can stay, you can avoid lukewarmness. When in reality, the book of Revelation, where that's derived from, lukewarm is talking about mixing law and grace. So it's like, okay, I, I'm setting the timer. One hour. And I believe in praying in tongues. Yeah, I'm just praying. I'm praying for an hour. I'm praying for an hour. I'm praying for an hour. Oh, all right, good. It's die. I'm glad that's over with. Imagine I take my wife out to a beautiful uh, Spaniard dinner. We have some tapitas. We have some croquetas. We sit down, and it's like, all right, you, all right. What time? What time is it, babe? Seven. Okay, I put my phone. Here's the timer. You have one hour. That's disrespectful, right? My wife would be like, I'm sorry. You know what? Let's just let's just quit. Let's stop. That is the same exact thing when we put a timer. And we're like, well, I'm doing this to, you know, get something. I scratch your back, you scratch my back. 
That's called dead works. Because justification comes by faith alone in the finished work of the cross. That is a infancy doctrine that the Bible says them that are babes in Christ, little babies, little infants who eat every doctrine, they are unfamiliar with the doctrine of righteousness, which is by faith. But after, good friend, after you receive the understanding and revelation that you have been made righteous by faith, after you understand the revelation of grace, that everything on this side of heaven, according to Romans chapter 5, therefore it is of faith, that it might be by grace. Romans 11 verse 6 says, if it's of grace, it's no longer of works. Okay, great. So everything on this side of heaven is by grace. So first I receive grace then i work it then I, I work it out i walk it out since we are resurrected since we are living in heaven let us think heavenly thoughts since we are in the spirit uh, galatians chapter 5 verse 25 since we are living in the spirit let us walk according to the spirit since we have been made holy by grace let us conduct our lives in a holy manner since we are priests and kings, let us carry ourselves as such. I love this illustration, and I got this from Pastor Prince. I always want to give that man credit when I can because, uh, I mean, I follow him as close as anyone can that lives on the other side of the world. And he was telling about he was talking about this story where uh, Queen Victoria of England, when her father passed away, she was maybe 12 years old. When her father passed away, all of a sudden she had like something clicked. She had an understanding that she was next in line to rule as queen of England. And before that, before her dad passed away, before, you know, that clicked, that's called revelation. Before that, and she was a Christian, by the way. Before that understanding like clicked, she was kind of like giggly and gullible. And, you know, she was kind of like just, just like a child, just just very childish. You know, she was a child after all. But then once that understanding came, like, hey, I am a queen. Oh my gosh, I am, I'm royalty. Does that sound familiar? I'm a, I'm a king. I'm a priest. Then her conduct and her character changed. She said, and this is from her uh, biography, that as soon as she had that understanding, she said, if I'm to be queen, I will conduct my affairs as a queen so what happened right then and there was she like changed from a pauper to a queen or was she always born royalty and she just had the understanding the ah oh, i'm royalty it's not like right then and there she was like transformed from a pauper to a queen from a peasant that's what a pauper is it's not like she was transformed from a peasant to a queen. Now I need to be a queen. No, she was always a queen. It's just revelation dawn and her conduct followed. In the same exact way, you have already been made holy by grace. So conduct your lives in a holy manner. You have been redeemed. You are righteous by faith. So act like a righteous woman, like a righteous man. You are a priest by grace. It's fulfilled on your behalf. So act like a priest. Act like a king. Act like royalty. You are made holy and blameless. You are cleansed and purged from your sins. So conduct yourselves as someone who is dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God. Romans chapter 6. So this is called good works. Now we're, we're bringing this to a close. Do you see the difference? One hand is like, I need to do something to get. I need to do something to become. On the other hand, good works, where the Bible talks a lot about good works, is out of the finished product, which is the cross of Christ, you walk it out, which is called good works. Now you're not praying to appease the wrath of God because the wrath of God was appeased completely on the body of Jesus Christ. Now you're not praying and fasting to get deliverance. You have been delivered and that by the cross of Christ. Now you're not uh, quitting the nicotine habit. So now God, now you're worthy enough to be healed from that pain in your knee. 
by his stripe you were already healed it's not it's not contingent on you it it, it kind of breaks our ego because it has nothing to do with us the covenant is between god and jesus we are beneficiaries of that covenant this is another error that i believed you know we were in a covenant with god i'm sorry i have i have a sinful body of death i'm living in this tent which is called the flesh and it's it's broken it's vile the bible calls it the bible calls it the body of death if the covenant is between me and god it's been broken before i was even born because i cannot you cannot but the truth is this is finding galatians chapter 4 that the covenant is made between god and jesus Therefore, it is. It, it can never be broken. Jesus is sinless and perfect. And we are just the benefactors of that covenant between God and Jesus. So you don't have to do your part. And God does his part. Jesus did our part. And God has already done his part. It's finished. It's finito. It's a done deal. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, you are blessed already with all spiritual blessings. It's done. You are. It's finished. That is why Jesus said it is finished. What a revelation. So I want to end here. Is that this is the difference between good works and, and dead works. Dead works, what is it again, class? Dead works is doing anything to try to appease the wrath of God. I, I, I do this. God is going to you know think I'm worthy enough. I do this. I'm going to get the anointing. I do this. Then a hundred souls are going to be saved in my ministry. I'm serving. I'm doing. I'm doing. It's exhausting just even talking about it. But when you understand that you have been made righteous by faith and by grace alone, then yes, I will serve my church. Not to appease the wrath of God, not because I feel guilty, but I do it out of joy. Yes, I will act holy, not because I'm trying to be holy, but because I've been made holy. And since I am made holy, let us live a life worthy of the Lord. That's called good works. Do you see how these these like th these come into into sequence very very nicely? There is no contradiction between uh, you know good works and, and and grace. They come together very nicely. The Bible says it is between dead works and good works. Dead works is called religion. Good works is called faith. That is why James says faith without works is dead, because it, it's eventually. If you have faith, the fruit will be there to show it. That is why James says, you have faith? Great. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So works is a, it, it comes second, it's secondary to understanding you are righteous by faith. To understanding the finished work of the cross of Christ. That's called the grace. That is why the Bible says it is the gift of God, not of any works, lest any man should boast. But then two verses later in Ephesians chapter 2, it says we are ordained to good works. Because on one end, dead works is saying everything that has been given to you is by grace. Now receive it and then walk it out. So I want to end it here is that it, th th this is this is I hope and I know that it's helping you because this is answering a lot of questions, a lot of uh, heart burning, inquisitive questions that you have as you read through the Bible. Understand the difference between dead works and good works. Understand that you have been made righteous by faith alone. Once you are made righteous by faith alone, I agree eventually good works should be evident in your life that's called fruit but let us not put the carriage before the horse let us walk it out let us not pervert the gospel of god let us not pervert the holy scriptures let us walk in sequence with the lord himself and realize that we are saved by grace alone we are made righteous by faith alone. After we are saved by grace, after we are made righteous by faith, eventually 
the fruit of holiness will be there. You don't keep the law for holiness. The law is an en is an enemy, an enemy against grace. Gra uh, holiness only comes by grace. So when you realize that, you, you all of a sudden things are making sense. You start to read the scriptures and your soul becomes flooded with light. You start to understand. And that is why the Bible says, let us go on to perfection in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Because once we have all these questions answered about the first principles of the doctrine of Christ, then we will go on to perfection. Then we will mature. That word perfection, it means to be fully matured. It doesn't mean perfected in your conduct, but it means to be mature in your understanding. And if you are mature in your understanding, there should be fruit. So I want to end there and uh, I want to continue to encourage you. Continue to press in. Listen to the word of God. Be renewed. Because man, I'm telling you from, from my own experience, these strongholds are so uh, easily broken by the word of god one but easily brought back by our own doubt and logical reasoning it's very easy to forget so that's why i keep listening listening listen to the 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 word of god not religiously you're not trying to appease the wrath of god you're not trying to score points with god you're just listening because you want to understand what jesus has done for you isn't that amazing so i want to end here and i want to thank you once again and until next one, I will see you guys. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. I hope you're encouraged by it. If you believe in what we're doing and want to help us continue spreading the word about our gracious and loving Savior, consider supporting our podcast. Your contribution, whether it's a one-time gift or becoming a monthly partner, goes directly towards our media and our video production efforts. Together, we can continue to share the good news to those that need it the most. Visit our website to give today. And thank you for your generosity.